There we go. So a big welcome to everyone that's on tonight. My name is Dana Ripper. I'm with the Missouri River Bird Observatory. Our mission at here at MRBO is the conservation of birds and really all wildlife and their habitats via science, education, and conservation policy advocacy. You are at the first webinar in part two of our winter learning series, and we have six weeks in this part two, we're going until and including Monday night, March 27th. So um, hopefully folks will join us for the other webinars as well. This learning series is hosted by MRBO in partnership with the Missouri Birding Society and the Conservation Federation of Missouri. Um, and as I mentioned in the very first one during part one back in early January, um, we have some folks to thank, one of whom is on here tonight. I saw Patrice, thank you very much for your support of this series. Um, and to you, Edge Wade and some others for really encouraging us to make it happen. It's been really popular and we're really excited about that. So thank you. Um, I would like to introduce tonight's presenter. I know him pretty well. Um, he is the co-founder and my co-director here at the Missouri River Bird Observatory. Ethan Duke grew up in rural Western New York, um, hunting and fishing in his childhood and, and early adulthood. And he did a four-year tour of duty in the U.S. Air Force, followed by a degree in wildlife management from the State University of New York at Cobleskill. Uh, Ethan and I founded MRBO in 2010. We're located in Arrow Rock, Missouri, and we actually have a visitor center now, and hopefully folks will come visit us during April to October and um, see more of what MRBO is about and just kind of hang out and talk about birds. So with no further ado, Eve, I'm gonna hand it over to you to talk about Owls of the Midwest. Thank you, Dana, and welcome everybody. And I'm the co-founder and co-director of the Bird Observatory so with that, I wear a lot of hats, you know, so I do a lot of science, education and advocacy work. Um, and and recently, um, but not for long, I've been helping coordinate the Missouri Young Birders Club. Soon our, our new educator will take over that role. Um, so as part of that, we meet monthly and tonight's the night of the Young Birders Club meeting. So many young birders are tuning into this presentation because we decided our monthly meeting topic was going to be owls. So they'll be joining us for this, and then we're going to jump on to our meeting after this. So, um, so welcome to this talk, everybody, on uh, the owls of the Midwest. Um, I'll focus primarily on Missouri owls, um, but as I look at this beautiful picture of the short-eared owl by Chris Valentine, it makes me think we just finished up our uh, MRBO's photography contest, and so I really want to say thanks to all the entrants this year um, and the judges. And uh, also big thanks to Wooden Houston Bank. Um, they're our like local bank that really supports our community and they support birds too. So how cool is that? So, uh, so there's so many owls to cover and so many little time, but how many of you know this owl, I wonder? Hmm. Surprise, that's Falco. Falco is a Eurasian eagle owl that's been in the Central Park recently. He escaped from the Central Park Zoo and seems to be taking care of himself pretty well out there. Um, there's just he's just one of these these foreign birds, but there's so many owls out there and so little time to talk about them. But there's each one of those species is so fascinating. Um, but uh, let's let's just try to wrap our minds around owls tonight and, and our local owls. And uh, let's think about what makes owls unique and and what makes them kind of owly. You know, what makes an owl an owl? I mean, they're really widespread. There's different species all over the place, except for Antarctica, really. And and most owls prefer, you know, forests and woodlands, but they're in grasslands and open habitats like tundra and dense marshes and bogs. So there's just like a lot of other birds. They can occupy a lot of niches out there. Uh, and, and some even live in urban and suburban environments. So there's just something special about this group of birds though that, that really moves people deeply, you know, and it moves people like 
with deep cultural connections and deep individual connections. I mean, ever since we started grunting as a species, you know, we've we've had uh, a, a connection to owls. I mean, even in ancient Egypt, uh, they can be found in hieroglyphs, and and I think they represent like the letter M in hieroglyphs. So, I mean, these are deep, long connections, and they've been pl pl played an important part uh, in mythology throughout time with Native American tribes throughout our history. I mean, we've got even our Midwestern tribes and the Osage and the Potawatomi, they viewed owls as spiritual guides, as protectors. Owls associated with wisdom and protection and, and, and in the afterlife uh, throughout many Native American cultures. But people are captivated by them. I mean, look at Harry Potter and, and all these modern things. You see them on apparel all the time. So what, what is it about them? What's this unique thing? Well, let's just try to tap into them a little bit and look. But first, let's be very clear. When you see an owl, you're seeing a lot of feathers. Uh, but beneath their bodies, they're actually very small. And once you look a little bit deeper, then you can start to see kind of the inner part that makes them a little different from a lot of these other bird species. So one of the things that makes them unique and sort of and, and hawks and other raptors can kind of do this well, but they can turn their heads around really far. Well, certainly much farther than humans can. So well, how far can they turn them around? Well, a lot of people say they can turn them all the way around. Um, but it's a myth that they can go 360. They can go about 270 or about 180 degrees either way. And, and so, I mean, if we imagined us trying to turn our heads around like that, it would not be very comfortable. In fact, we wouldn't be able to do it because it would choke off our blood supply. We could even turn around like this owl is right there. So we just have a different structure, you know, rotating our necks would, would just cut off that, that blood flow to our brain, sort of like a hose, you know, kicking that hose off. But with these owls, they, they have these special adaptations and researchers found um, that they they have these little tiny reservoirs and uh, where they can store blood temporarily even. So they can help keep that oxygenated. Um, they, they've also found that um, uh, this, the structures going all the way up through around these tiny reservoirs and all the vertebrae uh, not only can they temporarily store that there, but they also have that protector of these these uh, holes through the vertebrae that gives it an extra room. So it's like having a protector around that hose, keeping it from getting kinked up like that. So, I mean, that's that's a pretty unique thing. It's a pretty unique, amazing structure. A lot of vertebrae, the vertebrae are spaced under their cranium uh, with a single occipital condyle, much different than us. That's a lot of evolutionary uh, uh, development. Why would they want to be able to do that? You know, why would they have to have that kind of feature? Well, one of those things that makes them unique is that they have ocular immobility. Their eyes are just fixed in these bony structures. So they have to be able to have a high degree of mobility in their head to be able to look around, especially as good predators. So they have these incredibly large eyes to improve their efficiency, especially under low light conditions. And so these eyes are so well developed that they're not really even eyeballs, like we think of eyeballs, but they're elongated tubes. They're held in place by these like bony structures around there called uh, sclerotic rings. So for this reason, that the owls just can't roll its eyes and move its head around or, or move its eyes around. It can only look straight ahead. So this gives us all this binocular vision, which compared to monocular vision helps with depth perception. And so that's really important to help them be able to see a little bit more accurately. But remember, most of these owls are nocturnal, so they don't really have great color vision because they've put all their resources into having good night vision. They can see far better than we can at nighttime. They have these really big eyes and these really big pupils. And so they can allow in as many light rays as possible. But it takes up so much space in there. And like it, they actually take up much of their brain. Um, so you can see an owl's eyes. And, and 
even you could see his eyes if you look and you fold back and you look in their ear, you could see their eyes. That's how much area they take up. So you see their eyes are really important, but there's another sense that's also associated that they really rely on that helps make these birds owly or helps make them unique. Where are those ears? It's that sense of hearing is so important, but where are they located? We can't really see them with all those feathers. And we know those tufts that we see sometimes on some owls, those, those are just feather tufts. Those aren't really ear tufts. So what's going on here? Well, here's a skull. Owl hearing differs from us humans in a few ways, but some owl species can see a big difference. They can hear, we can see a big difference in the position of their ears. And they can hear a difference in position of things they're listening for. And it all has to do with that structure of their skull. That unique adaptation that they have allows the owl to determine not just sort of where they're hearing stereo left or right, but also up and down. So we don't usually see the owl's ears. You know, those feathers uh, protect them and we don't see them, but we see that large facial disc that they have. It's like an acoustic funnel that helps uh, owls funnel the sound into their ears. And they use these to locate those preys. They sort of, the play, they triangulate them so they can hear these little movements in the leaves and in the foliage, whether it's an insect or another sm small mammal or something, even down through the snow. So when they hear this noise, they can tell its direction because of the little difference that in time it takes for that sound to get to the left or the right ear. So if they hear this sound a little bit slower and, and the ear that's a little bit higher, they know that thing's a little bit lower. And so they can really get this down the difference of time down to like millionths of a second to help determine exactly where something is. So they have this weird asymmetrical ear thing going on. They've got these locked in eyes. Um, so it, it's really a, a unique feature uh, in the in the world of birds, and they're able to as they're flying around or they're perched and they're listening to you, they can really combine these sounds instantly in their brain to create a very clear mental image and space exactly where that source is located. So, I mean, these things are hard to see on the outside, but they begin to express themselves on the outside, and that's part of the owl that we can identify with. And just to give an example of how amazing that hearing is, just think of the great gray owl up in the far north. They can hear a mouse from over 330 feet away. And they can hear it through deep snow, like 18 inches of snow. And so living in an area where they have a ton of snow cover, that powerful sense becomes an extremely valuable part of their survival. So now we know a little bit more about some of our owl's adaptations. It makes them owly. So let's have a little bit of look at this family tree and start diving into these owls you might want to know a little bit more about. As we dive into this, um, I always want to plug uh, what I like as a resource. I usually like Cornell Lab of Ornithology's Birds of the World. I've always loved that thing since the beginning, since it was paper subscriptions. Uh, but it's a subscription service online but it's really worth the fee if you want that little next level of knowledge. So I like just dialing in the birds of the world and I'll jump right into taxonomy and see what they say about them. Well, it's pretty easy. There's two main families of owls of the world. There's one big family that is strigiformes, the typical owls. And, and, you know, they make up a bulk of these uh, 246 species of owls. Um, but there's there's 228 species of strigiformes, the typical owl. And then there's also the family of barn owls, which we're fortunate to have uh, one fam one of the representative of that family here is known as the American barn owl. They're pretty distinctive. You know, they, they always have that heart-shaped face kind of look to them. They often have these long legs. Um, so those are two family groups. There you have a good good breadth of their taxonomy right there, their family tree. You know, there's two families of them in the order that they belong to. So there's another look at Strigiformes, and you can see that there's 18 species in, in the world of the barn owls, 228 of Strigiformes. 
Another resource I like to do is I like to pull up our partner's website at mobirds.org. Go to the Missouri Birding Society's website, and there you'll find this annotated checklist of birds, which is very helpful. And you can just filter it out and look for owls, and it'll tell you the status of these owls, meaning their quoted status is kind of like where and how likely they are to be seen and when they're likely to be seen. And so right away, you can pull up these owls and be like, wow, these are the owls that have been seen in Missouri. And then you can see how rare they are, if they're permanent residents, what time of year they're there, that kind of thing. So um, I forgot to mention at the beginning, all the resources that I mentioned, they'll be in a follow-up email to this webinar. So you'll be able to find those uh, links there. So don't worry about it. And this, this webinar all, will also be posted on YouTube within the next week or so. I like to start out with sizes. When I try to get my mind around the, the this families, these two families of owls, or these nine species of owls in Missouri, I like to think about size. So here's a size chart. And here they are, inches, average, average size in inches. And we start out from the biggest to the smallest. Now, larger owls like to compete with smaller owls, and that can often be fatal, like pretty, pretty fatal, like they'll eat other owls. So that's why you have to be careful if you're trying to do a playback to, to solicit a vocalization of an owl. You certainly don't want to draw any small owls into where any large owls would be around. But this, this behavior makes them sort of do a little niche partitioning, makes them want to live in different spots. So it makes sense the larger owls can be out in the open. And these smaller ones prefer to be a little bit more concealed and cover and where, you know, the, the habitat's there to help keep them concealed. Um, and oftentimes they'll use nesting cavities and trees and, and burrows and things. But as we start out to the left here, you can see Snowy's that big one, you know, and then Snowy's a little bit bigger than uh, the Great Horned Owl, then down through Bard, Short-Eared Owl, Barn Owl. Long-eared owl, very close in size. Then we get smaller and they're, they're rarer to Missouri burrowing owl. Then we get the eastern screech owl and then the tiny, tiny little northern saw wet. So quite a range. We're pretty lucky to have this many owls here. But these big ones here, of course, the great horned, it's a really common permanent resident here. Then we have the snowy owl, which is a really sporadic winter visitor. Um, both large, they, they're formidable. Um, you know, th these snowies only come down occasionally. Uh, it's hypothesized that when there's a dearth or there's not many lemmings for them to eat in the wintertime up north, they like to come down south. Take a little closer look at them. Um, snowy owl is, is considered a vulnerable species conservation-wise. A beautiful thing that is. It's um, it, it's considered generally uncommon or kind of scarce. And what they found is that their populations and their distribution has really become clumped around uh, wherever there's food availability. And so they're kind of sparsely distributed with, with subpopulations kind of distributed across the tundra area. And then we see them occasionally as they move down here. The beautiful. <laughs> There's some begging calls. <laughs> and, and that one little who, you could hear that one little who in there. And that, that sound just kind of snuck up on me there. We prepared for these next owls to listen. But it's one of these birds that we're likely to see during the daytime uh, when they sporadically arrive in Missouri and, and uh, less, less likely to be hearing them. <clears throat> this one we'll hear. What a beautiful photo uh, by James Gorski here. Looks like it's carrying a sore or something like that. Uh, but it, you can really see the fine details in the structure of this bird. Obviously, big talons, strong bird. It's got that large facial disc, huge eyes. You can see these fine little bristles around its beak. Um, it looks kind of soft, like all owls are soft like that. Um, uh, they they have that classic hoot. Right now, the owls have been hooting a lot lately. We've got a lot of vocal owls in Missouri, and uh, they have a very distinctive, plaintive, classic hoo hoo sound. Here's their sound. <laughs> Very nice hoot. 
When we jump down in sizes a little bit, we'll jump down here to another really common owl and a not super common owl in Missouri. This barred owl is probably the one people hear and see the most. It's one of their most common owls. It's also kind of uh, crepuscular. It'll be, you'll see it around uh, early morning and the evenings, and it's often just uh, more visible around. Of course, it's going to be in a little bit more wooded areas than the big open areas like the Great Horn wants to be in. And then we have another visitor that comes down. Um, actually, we've seen this bird breeding in Missouri, but it's extremely rare. Uh, but that's a short-eared owl. It's our, it's our owl of grassland. So we'll take a little look at both of these. And first, we'll look at these barred owls that we often hear because they're so vocal. And they're often really vocal when they're courting. And they have that classic, who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. So the barred owl, called the barred owl because of that barring that it has there on its breast, but they had that who cooks for you, who cooks for you all sound. And then they sing back and forth. And the male is a little bit smaller than the female. So he's going to have a little bit higher pitched who all. And the female is going to have a little bit of a deeper voice as they, as they um, what they call caterwauling back and forth. And they often have this little whine of a scream that they give out just before they start into the caterwauling. So let's listen to that. That's that little whine. He heard a little bit of who all, but here, here's, here's a couple going back and forth. Really nice sounds from those owls. So we can jump over to the uh, short-eared owl by contrast. Short-eared owls are active at day at night. They fly around their prairies in Missouri like little moss. They hunt low just above the ground. Uh, often like quartering back and forth across an area with slightly sort of dihedral or upraised wings. Um, they use a lot of acoustic cues again to, to locate their prey. They've got that facial disc. Um, they seem to defy my earlier statement about not wanting the smaller owls kind of not wanting to be out in the open. They are that mid-sized owl. Um, but they know how to find that cover in the prairie. And there's also taking advantage of those daylight hours oftentimes when they may not have the competition. It'll be a little bit safer from those larger owls. So we, we've we seen them in prairies throughout Missouri. Um, if you have a chance to, to visit Missouri Prairie Foundation uh, uh, sites, their prairies, those high quality prairie remnants, they're often home to these um, short eared owls. And uh, so, yeah. Quite a different sound than those previous owls and quite distinctive. But again, you're more likely to see this one uh, before you hear it. Uh, out in our grasslands in Missouri. Uh, more often, you're going to see it in the wintertime as well. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not, not a typical breeder here in Missouri. Now I got a couple other really neat owls. Remember this, this um, similar size owls, but these are really easily distinguished two owls. I mean, look at these faces. Look at that classic heart-shaped face that our, our barn owl family, that different family of the typical owls has. We have a good, good contrast here between two different families of owls. And uh, they, they have that their own family. So um, we have, I have mislabeled that. I'm in big trouble. That should say long-eared owl. And, uh, not, but the Latin name is proper, but that's a long-eared owl on the right. And we'll, we'll dive into them uh, real quick. We're going to get to the barn owl first. The barn owl is pretty neat. Um, 
uh, and it's neat how we can have these human interactions with them and that uh, we, we often uh, can put up nest boxes for them. In fact, vineyards all throughout California will put up a lot of barn owl nest boxes to help control the rodent populations. And conservationists put them up here too, uh, to just to help them along. In fact, locally, master naturalists uh, around here, I know the coal camp and high lonesome chapters established nest boxes for them in the coal cramp prairie region. And they've really helped boost their, their nesting success down there. I've, I've seen full nest boxes down there with a lot of baby owls and so many sometimes they can't even all fit in a box um but we put one up at, at our house as well but no takers yet um but that's a that's a neat thing about them um they they have a very uh um long history of connection to people in fact people used to like to have them in their barns on farms because they would help with their rodent population. I even saw early book of barns of the of Missouri where they had holes structures in barns on purpose so that the barn owls could use them as well as uh, barn swallows to help with uh, invertebrate populations as well. So um, they have a very scary sound, and uh, I've found a recording that's not too scary, but you'll get the idea. Yes. If you're taking somebody camping for the first time and you're trying to get them over the fear of the outdoors, just hope that there's not a barn owl around. Jumping into the long-eared owl. Um, these are really neat um, owls in that they, they kind of, uh, uh, the, they can be found in groups, sort of, they, they nest in groups. And there's a couple known areas in Missouri, they also uh, do a clicking sound with their wings. Um, but if you're doing a big year um, and you really want to get some of your your harder to get find owls, this is definitely one you want to you want to go for. Obviously, named really well for those long ears, long ears, and they're often found in these like conifer stands as well. Um, but to hear them, they also have kind of a, that more classic hoot. But they also have the uh, pretty distinctive face markings. So I don't think you're going to confuse this with any other owl. In fact, I think all of our owls are pretty unique in, the, in their appearance. So let's listen to this one. Almost sounds sad. All of these audio files I've I've found. Uh, you can see the source links there, but I found them all on that Zeno Canto website. Um, so I'll, I'll include that with our list of resources. I thought I'd throw this bird in there. I wonder if people that are in the know in the birding community are like, oh, why is he saying burrowing owls? We don't usually have burrowing owls. Well, we don't. We've had a couple records of them, but they're a really neat bird. And uh, I mean, they're just really cute and grouchy looking birds. And we'd be really lucky to see one. Uh, and they have been known to, to come through Missouri. I think there was one uh, down in Dade County recently. I think there was one on a, some of uh, uh, some private lands too down in that complex but um i just thought they'd be worth mentioning um i can show you an ebird range map here but they they live in burrows in the in the grasslands i've i've found their burrows before like up in wyoming and elsewhere they're often littered with beetle shells and things but they're uh you can see they're typically uh much in the, this ebird map here shows quite well that they're they're typically a lot further west but you can see where they've they've shown up in Missouri and points east. And we have a couple other uh, little, little smaller owls yet. And um, the, the smallest of our owls, uh, the one there on the left is the Eastern Screech Owl. And they're really quite common 
Um, I, I, I've heard of some quite high counts on the Christmas bird count, especially in the Columbia region along the Katy Trail and elsewhere. And uh, they're um, often heard but not seen. Um, but that one happened to be one we caught at our migratory bird banding station at Grand Pass Conservation Area. And it happened to be first net run. It was very early in the morning, just at dawn, at Butch, which is very late at night for that bird. It had been up all night, so it was kind of sleepy. And then uh, then I'll I'll take a little deeper dive into these Sawat owls, that one on the right, in just a little bit. I love this this photo here by Mark Goodge and here are these uh, screech owls. Um, uh, they're really common, um, but you have to listen for them. And uh, they have some really, I think, a really nice sound. They can have this pulsing sound, sort of sounds like radar, and like a sonar on a submarine or something. And it varies in, in pitch rate. And, and rate, and then it's got a, um, a whinny sound that it does. Here's the whinny. Sounds a bit like a little horse, doesn't it? Winning away like that. So um, I, I wanted to, to go over and have a good run through. A lot of our owls, make sure you're familiar with all the owls that we have, some things about make them owly. And, uh, our, and I want to give a little bit more time to this particular owl because we at the Bird Observatory has spent more time with this particular owl than any other one. Northern sawwet owl is a, a really neat thing, and um, and and people I mean for its vocalization to start up quite yet. Um, it's it's occasionally heard, but it's been seldom seen. And right when we started up the bird observatory, uh, we thought we we um, thought and heard from others that it might be a good idea to to try to attempt to. To monitor them, so uh, I'll play its vocalization here, just so uh, we keep keep with li listening to know what they sound like. But it sort of sounds like heavy equipment backing up. So there. All these owls have uh, actually a host of different vocalizations they do. So keep in mind that these vocalizations I play are just kind of like the representative vocalizations of them. So why why go after sawwood owls in Missouri? I mean, back in the day, uh, this was kind of like an early range map. They just figured, well, yeah, maybe occasionally go far south, but they're pretty much a northern bird, right? Well, um, there were 34 records at the time we found 34 records in Missouri from like 1950 to 2005, like before we started monitoring for them. And uh, we were at a meeting and, and a couple of people suggested that we try to try to capture them. And then uh, Dana went up to a workshop uh, up in uh, Wisconsin with a guy named Gene Jacobs and sort of learned the processes and then also there's another another person, Jerry Toll at, at Council Bluffs, Iowa, at Hitchcock Nature Center, who's a who's a great raptor bander who also goes after northern sawwood owls in the evening. And so uh, with the help of and the wisdom of, of these people, we, we sort of try to get a start. And uh, they point us in the direction of this group called that's doing this protocol called Project Owlnet. And these are the locations, and this is an older map, but these are the locations of most of the Sawwet Owl banding stations throughout the country. And you can see there's a lot of them out in the east. But this is basically a network of crazy people that stay up into the wee hours trying to capture Sawwet Owls. They stay up on the listservs, drinking a lot of coffee, and uh, uh, documenting and, and sharing out what birds they're they're capturing and how many they're capturing and when they're capturing them. 
So we decided to follow their protocol and think about how they did it, how we might find success. And we looked at Jerry Toll Station. He's up on a ridge at Council Bluffs, a natural funnel for migratory birds. So we're like, well, how are we going to find something like that, considering our location and where we were at? So we said, well, let's let's try to start at home here and, and outside of Marshall and Saline County and see what we can do uh, to try to capture them. Well, we have a Salt Fork Creek and our little watershed has some remnants of riparian zones. And not far away from us, we have a place called Indian Foothills Park. So we thought, well, let's let's see about setting up at these kind of locations and we'll try at home and see, and see how it goes. Well, um, we set up our nets, uh, um, only a few nets in the, a thick area because we knew they would want to have a thick cover. And um, the protocol calls for running through like mid-October to mid-November. That's usually peak owl time. You can think Halloween is probably the peak time for northern solid owls. And so we open right about a half an hour after sunset. We check the nets every 30 or 40 minutes and we broadcast their vocalization, that toot, toot, toot vocalization. That's the protocol. That's what people use. And, and uh, we, we were pretty surprised that we had success right off the bat. Uh, we caught 18 in 2011 and 29 in 2012. And then what, we tried all sorts of different times. So we, we stretched it way out. We knew that was the peak time up through November, but we tried to later in the year and we really started experimenting around to see when we could get them. We started catching them right away. Then we, uh, we, we caught some more in 2014. So we caught 10 owls in Marshall. I mean, so this isn't like big, huge bird numbers. It takes a bunch of effort to do this. And so we, but we, we caught 10 in, in Marshall. Then we tried a couple times in Arrow Rock uh, at the visitor center there. And we ended up catching a couple there. And then we went in 2015. We got a few more in Marshall and we got uh, a few more in Arrow Rock. And then 2016, we moved permanently to Arrow Rock and we got 51 owls in one night. And then, we started to say, oh my goodness, there can be big years for these owls. So it can be um, a, a pretty great thing. And so we, we, we started thinking, well, we can start asking more general public to come out um, to try to, to experience this and, and, and see it because we're so afraid of wasting people's time. But so once we started catching more owls, particularly in Arrow Rock, we started inviting the public. And uh, then uh, Paige Whitaker, our, our former educator, came along and helped out a lot. And, and we had some big nights there, we caught 20 owls and 18 nights one year. And then in the next year, we caught 10 owls and 12 nights. And so that's 2017 and 2018. And you can see they go up and down, up and down. Um, we caught 12 owls and 10 nights in 2019. And then, as we know, we had the pandemic in 2020. And so uh, um, we also decided it was right around election time. And so instead of everybody watching those elections all night, why not give them something more enjoyable to watch like owls? So uh, we decided to live stream it and, and share it that way. Uh, for the last couple of years, we did that uh, during the pandemic. Um, and, and just so you know, you might wonder what, what's in that image there. That photograph is an, a sawwat owl under uh, UV light. And they have uh, a, a pigment, a remnant pigment called porphyrin and very new feathers. So we can use that uh, UV light to see how many new feathers they have versus older feathers. And that's important because you can use the amount of an age of different feathers to age, roughly age, uh, these owls. So if they have uniform, all pink across all their, their feather groups, you know, they're a hatchier owl. So um, it's just one neat aspect of, of the data collection of the owls as we capture them and ban them. That's one of the neat neat things we can find out about them and one, one neat way to track a, a a characteristic of them, a data point. Well, uh, in 2021, 20, we caught seven owls in two nights. We didn't put a lot of effort in 2021 because there still wasn't a lot of people coming out. And we primarily started doing this for education purposes. 
This last year in 2022, uh, we caught five owls in six nights. Overall, we've caught 250 northern Salwood owls all over the state. So we went from having that really small sample size throughout Missouri uh, to really saying, these birds are actually here in greater numbers than we ever thought. And over the years, it's been a lot of fun to work with a lot of interns and assistants on, on this project uh, and volunteers. And everybody loves uh, these northern sawwood owls. And they're a good bird because for, for banding purposes, uh, because they're sturdy uh, a bird and they, uh, they don't stress very much. But one of the unique things about capturing sawwood owls, unlike a lot of other bird banding, is there a high incidence of what we call foreign recoveries? And we catch a lot of other people's birds and uh, other people catch our birds that we banned. And so there's a little list here uh, of, of birds that um, uh, we, we've recaptured um, or, or other people have captured our birds. So um, foreign recoveries by us, us and foreign recoveries by others. And I'll just pull up some maps here to make it a little bit easier. Um, I will say there's a lot of times where we've had success across the state. Um, I think we broke a record going down here to um, around uh, Springfield area. We There's a Dr. Andrew Kinslow and uh, uh, Janice Green and a couple others We at a university down there. We, we banded with them and caught a, a couple owls or caught now on um, Martin Luther King Day in 2012. And we've caught some with our friends, Bob and Pat Perry down in Rolla. And uh, with some the Master Naturals group down there, and then there's uh, a bunch with Master Naturals down in Warsaw. Uh, we caught nine on, on one night down there. Um, so we we've had a smattering of success around the state, but we've also had a lot of skunked nights. You can imagine traveling across the state, setting up, doing all the effort, and then kind of getting skunked on them. So we really did find that 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 one peak window between uh, October and November is really where it's where it's at. Um, just to show you a couple of these neat foreign recoveries, uh, you can see the earlier date here in November of 2012 at Foothills Park in Marshall, we caught an owl, caught and banded an owl. A whole entire year later, we captured the same individual owl a mile south. So that individual owl had spent its winter in Missouri, went all the way back up to some breeding grounds north, and then returned back to uh, the roughly the same area, just a mile south. So that's, that's a pretty neat data point. Then there is this one owl that we caught in February down in Warsaw, and we caught the same owl a year later, a little bit more than a year later, back up in Marshall. What are the chances of that? We also um, captured an uh, owl, uh, a, a few owls, like these, these owls from uh, points north, uh, from anywhere from Wisconsin to Minnesota to north of Michigan, Saskatchewan. Um, you, you can see these similar regions. Obviously, it's, it might be some bias of banding station, but it looks like a lot of these owls are making straight uh, north-south trajectories. Thunder Bay, Ontario. Couple owls actually from up here at um, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Uh, I forget how far that is. I think it's like a couple thousand miles or something like that, all uh, the way from uh, from that point north. And so these owls are flying like thirty miles a, a night. So that's they're not really it's speed demons, and they're just making their way down here but it's it's pretty amazing how far such a small owl will migrate um, thinking it's going to have a better winter here um, so uh, we have had friends out the world bird sanctuary that started banding solid owls out there in st louis of course there are friends down south and then we had uh, some friends out west uh, by st joe that started capturing them so i think this sort of spread like wildfire for a little while and then there was another, there's a graduate student working down in Arkansas that was doing radio telemetry, uh, tracking them down there too, which is really neat. Um, but there's a, there's a lot to it and there's a lot more I'd, I want to share about them. Um, uh, they're such a great uh, uh, medium 
for for talking about not only owls but all birds but we we uh, had a really successful program last year where we had some local university folks down uh, from an astronomy lab and some dark sky advocates and we had a owls under the night sky program where we got to look at planets and constellations and things through the really nice telescopes and band owls at the same time in arrow rock and it was really great and we thought about more questions we can answer and it's kind of the future of more owl work but hopefully uh some of you can be able to make the trip up and this next uh october or november to arrow rock and maybe get to see some of these amazing little creatures uh, yourselves so um, that about wraps it up for me. I tried to keep it to about 50 minutes because I wanted to leave time for Q&A if that's possible. And um, I'm, I'm really happy to take any questions. I just want to say that owls are incredible creatures. They've captured our imaginations for centuries. So if we just explore their taxonomy and their behaviors a little bit more and our cultural connections to owls, we can gain these deeper appreciations and understandings of them. And if they mean something to you and you really like them, uh, you can always share them with others. And I encourage you to do that. Share your love with owls with other people because I think it makes everybody's lives a little bit better. So with that, I'll, I'll stop for any questions. If there are really quite a lot of questions, there's some in the Q&A and some in the chat. Um, and we also have some friends from afar putting nice notes in the chat that we haven't seen in a really long time. Um, I don't know what you are able to see. Would you like me to read questions to you? Would that be helpful? You're on mute, my friend. That yeah, would certainly would help. If you, okay. If, if you could do that. Very good. Okay. So the first one um, came in quite a little bit ago from Miguel. Let me find this. It's, I think, very important. Um, a question about observing owls. Short eared owls hunt by sound and sight. This past winter, I observed a known small area frequented by owls. 50 plus cars, some idling loudly, music playing. Then over 50 people out of the car, setting up cameras, tripods, et cetera, talking loudly, and then chasing the owls when perched. How does this human interaction impact owl behavior? Well, that's just a great question to start off with, because, I mean, uh, most of the birders I know in, in, in Missouri are, are familiar, at least, with the uh, birders' code of ethics. And our Missouri Young Birders Club people certainly know the Birders Club of Ethics, Code of Ethics. And so one thing you don't want to do is harass or disrupt a bird's normal activity patterns. Um, and you can imagine with owls and things, you just would imagine that uh, any acoustic disturbance, they might be more particularly um, uh, sensitive to. Uh, so I don't, I'm not aware of any particular studies that quantify this, but it's, it just seems like common sense that people would know enough to sense if the bird's being distracted and to step away. And I know though of instances, particularly I, I recall them with snowy owls. You can imagine a, a lot of times these owls are coming down because they're really hungry and they haven't been able to you know, find a lot of lemmings. So they come down further south and there may not be a lot of food resources here for them either. Um, so they're kind of in a stress state to begin with. And if humans are interacting with them or, or putting pressure on them, that's just going to exacerbate the situation. So I, I, I think it's just a good avenue to find diplomacy, to keep having this, asking that question and keep communicating that with others uh, to, to try to limit that and, and make that a known thing. Our birding community is so great in Missouri that there's a lot of great dialogue on the uh, MoBirds listserv. So the Missouri Birding Society's listserv really has a lot of good communication. So when those types of things come up, it'd be a good time to, to ask about those, you know, tactfully and not try to be really mean to people, but 
like make sure people know that what's appropriate and what's what's not. <clears throat> if anybody else has any any other additional better things to say on that, um, please please put it in the chat too. You brought up snowy owls, so I'm going to go to a question in the Q and A. Um, and I did actually look this up on eBird when I saw it come in, um, so I can put the eBird occurrence map in the chat. But are snowy owls present during the winter in all parts of Missouri, or is there there a region they frequent most? Mm, I'd have to pull up the eBird thing to give you a specific answer. I do know that there are flying over school group classrooms in Rala. You know, they, I think it's just a matter about severity of weather and, and how much of the population moves down. Um, I, I wouldn't, on a big snowy owl year, I would expect them almost anywhere. You know, it's going to be your chances are less as you go further south in latitude, your chances are less. But in general, Keep your eyes open for something that looks like a big white blob out in the field. <laughs> and that's pretty much what the eBird map says, is what you just said. They do need to be in a place where someone sees them and reports them as well, right? Yep. Um, so let's see. Would a barn owl ever eat a barn swallow? I bet they would. I bet they would. Um, you know, the, these raptors, their instincts are so strong. That falco, the Eurasian eagle owl that's up there in uh, um, uh, Central Park, it's been captive forever, but their instincts are so strong. They're making do with whatever they can catch. And they're not too picky. You know, I remember we had a, a couple people park their trucks under our box elder tree at our house only to have... Um, barred owls and red-shouldered hawks drop uh, uh, crayfish shells on them. So, you know, the, you know, they'll often go right up to the edge of water even, or, you know, our crayfish out in, in our grasslands too. But um, they, they're very opportunistic. So I'm sure they would snatch them up. Oops, sorry, mute. Um... So Kathy Sue asked about caterwauling and its relationship to breeding. And mm -hmm. is it a, a breeding vocalization phenomenon? It's definitely um, uh, uh, within species communication that, that happens. If you look at on the, uh, uh, likely on all about birds, but it's birds of the world has a life, um, full life cycle chart of all these bird species. And if you look at the barred owl, it's like nine months of their life is somewhere in their breeding cycle. It's like, it seems like they're always about family time for some reason. And so I'm not sure of, of exact um, points in a motivational state when that's like territorial or when it's made attraction, but it certainly is pairs that seem to do it back and forth the most because adult owls do not tolerate young ones coming into their territory um, uh, and, and trying to uh, uh, attract their mates. You know, there's some variations with that. Um, for instance, um, saw what owls are known to be uh, cooperative breeders with the, the uh, older siblings helping take care of the younger ones. But um, by and large, that's, I think that is a pretty much a mate thing that's happening there. A little bit earlier question in the chat also from JL in Kansas City. He said that he's got um, great horns and barred owl in the same neighborhood. Um, scary, is that scary. a common thing or is are they just lucky over there? We have that here. We have that here too. Um, when you have that edge interface of open habitat with a little bit of you know, that suburban area where you're going to have a few more trees and things. It might be just that balance that they get just that right spot where you can have them both. You know? And, and you are lucky to have them both. And uh, we have them too, but I always get nervous. I'm like, you better be careful, barred owls. <laughs> Let's 
So Kyla would like to know, purveyor of many, many enthusiastic comments in the chat, <laughs> um, one of our Missouri Young Birders Club members, um, what is your favorite type of elf? Oh, wow. I, I love them all. I can't, I don't have a favorite. I love them all. Whatever owl I see, I like, I like their sounds. So I don't know. Whatever owl is making the nicest sound at any given time, maybe. Jack asks, how are owl populations doing in general? Well, um, so when I mentioned that the uh, snowy owl is vulnerable, um, I think even on All About Birds, you can look up each of these owl species and they'll mention the CITES, they'll mention like global um, groups out there, uh, what they, how they're estimating uh, their, their status and trends. eBird, uh, there's a link to that, that one map I think I showed with the um, uh, burrowing owl was actually the eBird status and trends maps. And they will show you not only the, the status of the birds, whether they're vulnerable or least concern or whatnot, they'll also um, kind of map out uh, where their populations are increasing or decreasing. Um, and, and one thing that we at the Bird Observatory refer to, um, not only the Missouri Bird Technical Plan developed by partners in the Missouri Department of Conservation, but also we look at the uh, uh, partners in flight uh, scores. And those are derived from looking and assessing threats on breeding grounds, threats on wintering grounds, threats to migration habitat, um, trends over the last 60 years, um, a variety of factors and overall population size, um, and maybe maybe things like climate change to really see uh, what, what their status is. So I'd recommend looking up for the individual species, any of those resources, starting with Cornell's uh, eBird status and trends um, to get really see where they're at, because that's, that's one of the first things I look for too. Uh, but most of our owls here are doing pretty well. Uh, they're pretty common. They're doing really well. Um, I always worry most about birds of our most imperiled habitats as far as status is concerned. I mean, short-eared owls seem to be doing pretty good, but they're doing better than their prairie habitat is. So I worry about you know, grassland birds an awful lot. There's a couple questions that I might ask, you know, obviously you, Ethan, but also if others want to comment in the chat, um, Gwynny asks, what's the best place to see owls near Kansas City? And I think that our Kansas City folks that are on this Zoom might be better place to answer that probably than us because we're about an hour and a half east. Um, Sue from St. Louis asks, I often hear barred owls in my suburban neighborhood. Do you recommend owl nest boxes to attract other species and which kind? And I was thinking, Ethan, that you, you know, screech owls use nest boxes the most. And so I was about to write back to Sue, but I wanted to make sure I wasn't forgetting anything. Yeah. I mean, I haven't had any personal experiences with it, but I've seen a lot of successful, you know, screech owl nest boxes, you know, the right, right habitat for the right box. Mm -hmm. And so, um, nice thing. I, I, we have uh, a friend of ours that had success, had a successful screech owl box on the side of her house. I think she was in the suburb in Kansas city and, uh, Correct. you know, but if there's barred owls around regularly, yeah, you can, I'd be, I'd be you, worried about that. Yeah. I mean, you might want to just go with a barred owl box at that point. Let's see. Kansas Cityans, any any good places to see owls near KC? Uh, Ryan asks, hi, Ryan. Uh, any comment on the origin of the myth about owls appearing outside people's windows slash homes? Kind of like cardinals visiting homes being a deceased relative. There certainly is that myth. Well the call is not coming from inside the house. Um, I, I don't know if I'm following the question. Like is. Oh, just the origin of owls as, as 
I think Harbingers of Death, probably, which yep. is yeah, I've I've heard certainly of, commonly thought about. I've heard of that before, and I think I mean there's a lot of different origin stories and a lot of a lot of different um, uh, myths and legends, uh, but I think in general there's something about um, uh, uh, Native American connections with understanding um owls being of two worlds you know because there's night and day and that may connect to two different worlds of life and death and so i think like medicine people and shamans were the ones that could really communicate with them the owls and owls would be like their messengers so i think you know that probably got misconstrued as being an origin you know an omen of death when it's really just kind of a between two worlds kind of thing you know it's not anything i'd you know that you know people have a uh, they 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 fear death so much they have a propensity to make things up like that <laughs> i know we need to wrap up quite soon because um ethan and some of the folks on here need to move actually to a missouri young birders club meeting so I do want to take one more question, though, and then we will check out the chat and the Q&A. And if there's anything that really wasn't answered or that we're not providing resources for, we'll make sure that we do that. Um, but Kathy asks, um, and Kathy, thank you for your comments in the chat about Jerry Toll. He's a great mentor in Bander. Um, she says, we had a barred owl hit a window at night, lights on inside. Why do you think this happened? Is it common? Wow. Um, uh, as some of you may know that um, Dana kind of helps spearhead a project, uh, Bird Safe KC, and, and spends a lot of time advocating for bird window collisions. Maybe some is more in her wheelhouse than it is mine. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what would cause an owl. I've seen impressions in windows before where that's happened, and it's it, it might be the same things that causes daytime collisions. I would have to say that owls hitting a window is not terribly common. I mean, not nearly as common as many of our um, passerins and, and other migrants. Um, light at night, artificial light at night is, um, it's very, very disorienting to birds and, and really all wildlife in various ways. Um, so in the case of your owl there, Possibly it was going after something and became disoriented um, and struck the window is what I would think would be the most likely cause. But um, now that you're asking this question, Kathy, honestly, because of what Ethan describes about owls' eyes and, and how, in, how intensely they see and um, it, how basically good their senses are, um, anything that is disorienting, right, is going to be like extra disorienting to them. Um, and so really the best thing to do is just kind of at night, right, everyone residentially and on other buildings, um, it's a great idea to just keep your artificial light that you're using at night as low as possible for, for all wildlife, really, and for yourself as well. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of really good info on this topic, and we can put that in the follow-up email because it's a great it's a really important conservation measure so yes thank you for asking that question mm -hmm. <laughs> um so i'm just going to finish up here i just posted an answer in the q a um peggy asked about um it sounds like she came late and we have been recording and we will send out the link to the recording in the follow-up email as well folks so um and i think ethan right i would say if anybody has any questions they should feel free to email us yes. or you specifically <laughs> yes yeah, send, send them our way and be happy to answer them and uh just share that love of owls out there they're really they're just a, a fascinating uh, part of our bird community Thanks everybody. And Thank sorry you. that we, we need to jump over to another zoom. Really appreciate you all very much. And we hope to see you next time.